Hello, and welcome to Android Developers Backstage, the podcast. I am Chet Haas from the, what team am I on? Toolkit team. <laughs> I'm Roman Guy, also from the Toolkit team. And I'm Tor Norby, and I represent Android Studio. And you represent it very, very well. <laughs> Mr. Tools, I don't think I've ever heard a conversation with you where you weren't at least talking about tools or wanting to well, talk about tools. The thing is, I've worked on good. tools for 26, 27 years now, and I plan to do nothing else. And yet you haven't mentioned Lint yet. All right. And you oh. just, oh, no, no, not down <laughs> that chasm quite yet. So, uh, so that's interesting. So tools, we, we all do the same thing over and over and over again. You've certainly done that well with tools and we all do our tool kitty graphic -y things. Animations, like, graphics. Yeah. So Google as a, as a company, as an engineering organization from the early days, like the way that they hired engineers, the way that I understood it, and I should point out, I'm not in Google, I'm in Android, which is a very different type of organization. Google hired engineers kind of as plug and play. Software engineers write software. It doesn't matter what kind of software it is. They just write software. And so we're going to hire one of the world's experts on 3D systems, and they're going to work on internationalization software, to quote a random... Yeah, it sounds like there's, the, there's a story behind right? this. <laughs> yeah. um, and you know other people that like they had their name associated with some fundamental patent in the graphics space, and they end up doing completely different things because software people just write software. And I feel like many of the people on Android, including us, are not that, right? Like we could write software, but that's not what we want to do. We want to write particular kinds of software. You want to work on tools. You want to work on UI and graphics and performance. And that's why I go to meetings Same. all day. Well, I can't say it actually worked for us, but I can say they haven't plugged and played us into other things. Well, I heard that the day I joined Google, apparently some other org was like, well, we get that engineer because it's our turn or something. And and they took an escalation. It's like, no, no, no. <laughs> he had specifically wanted to join the Android team and that's yeah. why. That was that was a little bit weird. And and back at that time, that was just around the time that I think Google was switching from a model where someone would get hired and wouldn't even know what they were doing. And then teams would sort of bid on them internally and you would shop yourself. When I joined as an intern, I didn't know what I was going to do. Yep. And technically, I was on Google Books. I, re I remember that story. So, yeah. Yes. And how long did that last? One Two day? weeks. Two weeks. Okay. How did you do on that? Did you you shipped your product? Obviously, <laughs> I did not, and I was not even working on Google Books itself. I was working on something email related. I think it was some kind of skunk work project. Yep. Uh, from anyway. Yep. You know, I'm sure the the listeners or viewers, hello, are wondering, uh, are wondering what, what we're doing. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe we should. Maybe and we have the same question. Yeah. This is basically we actually our plan had been to talk about Lint, and I was very excited. Uh, <laughs> Then we decided this is the year-end episode. Let's have a year-end episode where we talk about things that we thought were big or not big this year. You know, things we like, things we didn't like. And so that was our plan, basically, is to sort of just us hosts talk about what we Do like. we have to talk about 2023? I'm glad it's over. So <laughs> I'm going to shoot the chat. Yes. All right. Yes. Yeah. Um, stuff. So what happened this year? There was, an, there was an Android 14 release. There were devices of different form factors. There were... Uh, libraries that shipped, uh, new versions of Android X stuff. What am I missing there I, in the Android world? I think the, the 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 biggest thing probably this year, I would say, is uh, AI. I mean, it really kind of... Wait, wait, wait. How do you spell that? <laughs> it, you know, uh, it's spelled intelligence, ML. you know, or a particular generative AI, you know, uh, really, really made a big splash this year. See, he's already plugging his stuff. <laughs> I, I think we just did an episode even, on this. I'm not, I'm not necessarily talking about StudioBot, right? I sure. am I am talking in general, right? Our industry, and actually not even our industry. Like, it is a pretty big deal that you can now converse with an agent, and it can sometimes give you good answers. Is that right? what we're doing here? Today? I mean, am I a bot? I mean, you remember the Turing test, right? And that I've, was considered really hard for a long time. You know, it started out with like the Eliza program that basically just rephrased your question back to you. You're like, ooh, it seems intelligent, right? And then you've had better and better attempts at this over the last few years where they, oh, I'll do typos like a real human being. They had all these little algorithms for making it seem human-like. But these things are, are, are and, quite interesting. And now the, the algorithm is to give you an answer that's not quite right. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. And you can't tell it's really insidious too you're like is that is that a fact is that a hallucination just like an engineer mm -hmm. yeah but uh, you don't know that about people so maybe to your point maybe that's why they're you know they're able to do better at these tests because they're yeah. just as insidious and cunning as people exactly yeah. 
Yeah. So, you know, uh, I think programming in general is something that these things are pretty good at, uh, especially, you know, maybe not expert level, but newbie things, right? Um, and so if you're wondering, what is the git command for this? Or what is the shell command for that? Or how do I do this in Python? Like if you have to if you have to glue something together and something you're kind of unfamiliar with, it's really good for that. I would phrase it differently. I think they're good at synthesizing, you know, a lot yeah. of what you would have to like gather yourself from different sources. And I, I don't think it eliminates the need sometimes of going deeper, you know, with an article or documentation, but it's a good starting point in, in a lot of situations. Uh, although I do love sometimes when I get an answer where it reminds me of being 15, you know, you have an assignment for class and you haven't read the book. And so you're just trying to like come up with three pages of empty <laughs> with a lot of words. Um, no, but yeah, in, in, in a lot of cases, it's, it, it's really useful to put you on the right path and definitely like, you know, to talk about studio, but, uh, that that's what I like cause you know, there are areas of Android for instance, they haven't touched in many years and it's a really, really good way of, you know, being reminded of how it works or what I should look at or, or to, how to get started, right? Yeah, and it wasn't necessarily even thinking in Studio Bot. No, I know, but... Looking ahead to things like Gemini, you know, and the alpha code thing that they announced, I have not played with it. But, the, you know, they're basically saying that it's 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 beating 85% of competitive programmers, you know, at these benchmarks. And that's it's pretty impressive. Is it on things that have already been sold by competitive programmers or is that new problems? I think not. I mean, they're, these are scientists. I would think they would be aware of that. Yeah. problem right uh and, and that is something someone has mentioned that you know we you know as we flood the internet with these hallucination results and then we retrain on them this is basically <laughs> this is going to reduce the signal because right now they're being trained i think in general on on human generated but there's output. another interesting aspect to all of this like in, gra in the world of graphics for instance um ai has been also pretty useful i'm sure you've seen nvidia they have their dlss uh upscaling solution so it's interesting, we almost given up on trying to render at native resolution uh, because, you know, the, the, the visual effects that we want of, from games is, are so demanding. It's like, okay, let's render at lower resolution and then we'll upscale the results as if it was rendered in 4K or whatever. Uh, and, and NVIDIA is using AI for that. But it's been interesting that AMD has been doing non-AI based solutions. So there's kind of like this, this competition going on between the two approaches. And I think it's fantastic because they're probably like, inspiring each other and forcing each other to get better hey, isn't this how the pixel camera zoom is so good uh i don't know if it was ai i think there was a bit of ai in that uh but i think a lot of it or at least the original version uh, uh, yeah We're talking about when you do like 20x yeah yeah no i and it's it's kind of in the, oh now. in the latest one yeah the, the original one they were using the micro movements of you holding the phone well they do that too right, right. but i think that there's something where they're really getting close to the optics and i think they're still right. like oh you know that looks like grass yeah and i'm sure it's a com look i'm good. sure it's a combination of multiple yeah. techniques both ai's and uh, non ai and non ai uh, I, I can't wait until they just show me something completely different because there i am looking at a landscape view in my town which is pretty dull in general and then it just shows me you know something from the grand canyon instead because it got bored like i can give you a much better view here you go well that's the thing about generative ai you can say well that's nice but make it prettier <laughs> you know can you fix the weather can you add some you know puppies into that field you know and it'll do it that would be much easier than taking care of a dog yeah yeah i like that idea i i am curious to see how much we start to depend on it for doing stuff as opposed to using it as a partner so i had somebody in some of the comedy stuff i was doing was saying so are you using this to like write your bits for jokes and stand up i'm like what is the fun in that no absolutely not i have zero interest in that because the joy is in actually coming up with the material but i can see an advantage if you're just looking for a lot of a lot of writing and creative stuff in general comes from just coming up with ideas like you brainstorm ideas and then you find things that are interesting and then you you eventually land on a path that you can pursue yeah, i mean i, I think you're feeling joy because you succeed at it but for someone who's trying to come up with something funny to say and you can't think of something well then this is a really good solution although actually i take that back this is a potential <laughs> solution i've tried yeah. a few times like i was getting a presentation let me see if i can is there some lighthearted joke or something I can use? And it's never been funny. Yeah. Uh, I should probably try harder. But, <laughs> you know, like I can see in the past I've had to give, you know, speeches. You know, I don't, I'm not talking about, you know, or maybe the tools yeah, was or really work good. related. I'm talking like you're, you're going to speak at someone's wedding or something, right? And you're trying to think, okay, what do I say that hasn't been said before? Well, maybe the yeah, was really good and told a joke like you would tell it. 
<laughs> that's right. Yeah, let me match your level of humor. You know, but but that's when you're trying to, you know, like in the old days, you'd find like a book of quotations or whatever and skim through, find something relevant, right? And this should be able to let you more quickly say, well, okay, this is the couple, this is the yeah. characters, you know, give me something. And I think it could be good for that. But it, But I still think it's going to be good as not the final product. You're not going to get up and read the thing that no. it generated. You're going to look at it and say, hey, yeah. these are some interesting ideas. Yeah, give me 10 on. ideas and then right. I'll pick the yeah. one best. I mean, the, yeah, the way I see it is, is as a tool, right? I, I've used some Gen AI tools when I do my photos, for instance, but it was not to say like, hey, make this photo look like it was taken at sunset. It was more someone left a piece of garbage on that beautiful landscape. I want to erase it and it's easier with an AI based tool than, you know, doing it pixel by pixel, like the old way. Um, so it would do the same thing for my town and my, my, my view of my town. It would just erase the entire landscape. <laughs> your land, your, your town is not that bad. <laughs> There's no <laughs> landscape. So it's not, it can't even be ugly. <laughs> it's flat. Burned. Nothing. Yeah. So, so I don't know, that seems like a pretty big thing for this year. I mean, this is the year where a, a lot of it yeah. really sort of. Because, I mean, the interesting thing about that technology in particular was it sort of took over everything, right? It wasn't just, hey, this company or that organization has a thing that you can use. It was, here's a fundamental thing that we can all build on to do whatever it is that we're doing. Even, you know, the graphics, like the upscaling stuff uh, that you're talking about, uh, studio bot for generating ideas while you're coding on the creative side, like it was entering into the whole like writer's strike thing. You know, it is, it's entering all different phases of what we're doing, whether it's creative or scientific. Um, so it's, yeah, how far is it going to go? And it's finding its way into all of the different products that these tech companies. And it's moving right? faster and faster and more and more research. It's yeah. uh, it's kind of an interesting time in the computer field, I think. It's another revolution. Uh, I, I guess so. Yeah, I, I am curious to see like five years from now, what will it have, what what will have happened, right? Like, is it going to, you know, reach some sort of steady state where it's integrated into stuff? Does it sort of reach natural bounds in these areas? And, you know, it went as far as it could go. I don't know. Yeah. We'll see. Uh, what else was big this year? Uh, so we, t we mentioned briefly devices, new devices for Android. Yeah. So what did we get? I bought the Pixel Fold. I was thinking it was, you know, like I was like, hmm, do I really need it? And the answer is no. <laughs> but, <laughs> you know, it was like, I'm, I'm a, I got a pretty good deal through my um, uh, carrier. Um, and then I thought it'd be kind of fun to have a new, something different. Every year I've, I've generally been upgrading the latest Pixels. It was like, it'd be fun to have something that is not like the normal candy bar. Uh, and so I did it. Uh, and, I, and I will admit that I'm mostly using it like in folded state. Like a thick phone. Yes, yes. Yeah. But every now and then it's nice to unfold it and have that surface. And, and at least all the built-in apps are doing, you know, are much nicer actually. There's a couple of third-party apps. I probably shouldn't shame them uh, here, but I'm going to do it anyway. Uh, no, maybe I shouldn't. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to do it. Uh, no, I'm not. <laughs> yeah, I am. Uh, threads. Because I actually, one of the other... Well, but it's a brand uh, new, it's a brand new app. this year is like I got off Twitter and I switched to Threads and I'm yeah. actually really happy there. Yeah. Uh, and I just wish there, I wish there, when I unfolded, I wish it was taking advantage of the whole space. But it is it is very nice. And, and excitingly for Roman, it's built in, in Jetpack and Pulse, which is kind of exciting. Yeah, too. but it's interesting what you're mentioning about the Fold is, is actually one of the strengths of the Fold. You mentioned using it uh, mostly closed, but because a lot of foldables either have a very tiny screen on the outside or it has a interesting aspect ratio. Yeah. Um, and I think that's awesome that the outside is like a regular phone. So, yeah. you know. I'm not, it didn't subtract anything. Right. And if an app is not quite optimized for the unfolded state, at least you can use it like you would on a regular pixel on the yeah. outside screen. So I, I think that's that's a very exciting Yeah, device. and it's fully usable in the unfolded state too. Mm -hmm. I just like, hey, can you please take advantage of more real estate? Can you go right. all the way out? Uh, yeah. Same thing with the Reddit app. I I would be I would be curious not to purchase one yet because I I kind of feel like it's not the right trade-offs for me but I would like to have it on loan for a month to see how I use it because to me it feels like it's going to weigh down too much in the pocket if I just end up using it as a regular phone like it's a little too thick and heavy for just being a phone for me but then I don't really envision you know unfolding it and reading a book on it like I don't do any serious reading or any any serious uh, content 
consumption on the device, like I save that for laptop for larger screens, is that screen large enough that I would actually change that and start using yeah, it? Yeah, because that, that, that's what I'm wondering too. It's yeah. like, would that change my habits? I think I, I like to read a lot and, you know, I very often I wish my, my, my phone was bigger, yeah. but I don't want a bigger phone. So it's, it's kind, kind of, of nice the for that. I, I do yeah. read on this. Uh, that's the other unfolded use case because it's much lighter than a tablet. So it is kind of, and when you hold it this close, you know, the... The angle is about the same as a large screen that's further away. Yeah. You know, so for actually watching movies or reading on it, it, you know, when I'm laying in bed holding it like this, it's nice that it's lighter than a tablet. So, you know, I think it's kind of nice. But I have heard from other people on the team who have the, uh, you know, the various flip phones, I guess that's what it's called, right? They're also foldable, but they're, yeah. they yeah. don't have a phone on the front. I mean, they have a small screen, but they are right. really meant to be used. Kind of like the old, I used to have a, a Motorola Razor, is that what it was called? Yeah. A, a rocker, I'm, I don't remember exactly, but people really like those things, that they fit in your pocket comfortably. Yeah. Well, not only that, but I kind of like a form factor where <laughs> the opposite of, of what I was saying about the Pixel Fold, where if it's slightly more inconvenient to get to your content, maybe you look at your phone a little less often. Oh, and maybe that's a good thing. aspirational thing, like, yeah. I mean, it's, yeah. It's, you know, so, I mean, I'm sure we all do that, right? Sometimes you, you take your phone out of your pocket and you unlock it and you're like, what am I? You don't even know what you're doing. It's like a yes. reflex almost. Yes. We could yeah. call it the uh, emotional wellness phone. <laughs> the new form factor. Digital well-being. Of, of, yes. Uh, yeah, I was curious about that one too, just because like I would love these things to be smaller in my pocket, not larger and heavier. Um, but maybe I just need a stronger belt. Well, I don't know because if you look at the uh, at what happened to smartphones, they only got bigger. Because <laughs> remember the yeah. the early uh, was it the Nexus one? When you see one now, it's like it's so tiny, tiny. and cute. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, for my money, the Nexus Seven that was a tablet. That was such was a, a good small device. Tablet, and that was really good. It was like I mean, I have pretty, I guess, pretty large hands. So for me, it was still a one hand. I could hold it in one hand, right? As opposed to like a ten inch tablet. But that form factor, and it was in portrait mode. Have you tried holding your Pixel Fold like the other way? <laughs> yeah, but there was just something about that, that. That was like the default thing. And I, it was like a large phone, really. Yeah. Uh, I think there might even have been some seven inch phones from some manufacturers. But uh, I don't know, that, that device to me was really great for all kinds of things. Not to put in your pocket as yeah, a phone, but it was great for around. consumption. Yeah. Maybe if we were going to replace our desktop phones with a device, then that could be the one because then I wouldn't have to put it in my pocket. It just sits on my desktop. Yeah. Yeah. That one was too large for me. And like, I think we've been getting closer and closer to there, but I always go, so this is, I'm, I'm running a Nex, uh, not a Nexus. I'm running a Pixel 7 now. And like that is kind of a sweet form factor for me. The Pro is just a little bit larger. What's a desktop phone? I, so I, I, for our listeners. Actually, what? Back in the early 1800s. What's a phone? I mean, it's funny how we still call these things phones because I yeah. think, at least to me, it's a music player. It's an internet yeah. access device. I, I, the one thing I don't use it for, I, I am 100% always in do not disturb mode. And, I, you know, calls go straight to the voicemail. If if I get calls, it's just not a thing. Yep. I'm always amused by the people like I'm out for, you know, a run or a walk in the neighborhood and someone's walking by doing the, like the crazy person thing of just talking to themselves. And then you realize, oh, they're having an extended conversation. I'm like, Why? Can't you do this over email? Isn't it much more efficient for you to just go home and send them a note? Why do you want to talk to this person for so very long? Surely they don't have that much to say. Yeah. <laughs> it's going to tell we're really social. <laughs> we're engineers. Engineers don't get into computers because of their people skills. Yeah. It's probably shouldn't generalize, but. <laughs> <clears throat> so what else? So that was, that was form factor. Yeah. So it was interesting to come out with other form factors. There was the watch thing. I haven't looked at the the new watches. You're, you've got a This Pixel is an watch. original Pixel watch. Okay, I didn't get yeah, the new one. I've got I that one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't have it on right now, but I like the round form factor. I assumed the second one is more of that. Um, yeah. More round. Battery life, I think, yeah. and a few other oh, things. Right. But right. You know, this one yeah. works for me. Yeah. It's, uh, it's interesting how it's becoming hard even for us who are, you know, the midst of all of it to keep track of all the new cool devices and products. Uh, I do keep lot. track. I just, I mean, know, I keep I'm, track, I'm but I'm able to not click the order button. I do struggle with it. Sure, I keep track, but, but like we can't yeah. like have every single one of them upgrade every time, yep. use every new product that even Google puts out, right? Like for instance, we we're talking about AI. Like I was really impressed. Like uh, once Bart came out, the speed at which it was added to other 
products like yeah. you know google docs google side and it's awesome because it's like an extra feature that really helps you yeah i used the feature the other day where you where it generates graphics for you in the slide deck mm -hmm. that was really handy because i'm terrible with graphics and my presentations are always the most unimpressive visually like I'll just use the default template. Just Chet has been like, using an AI for he's oh, been yeah, using actually, an AI for years. Mr. I've seen your, I've seen it's called all now. Yeah, you you were the one who fixed it, right? So yeah. this actually, you know, it's not completely solving it, but at least I can get an illustration, and it's kind of nice. Yeah, yeah. I don't use AI. I use UI. <laughs> uh, what, what, yeah, no, simple. No, oh, oh, oh. So one one big change. One of the reasons that I don't feel like. I track all of our devices and the capabilities of these things as closely is because there's been a pretty big change from the early days when we were on the team where every year we would have a new Nexus device if we were, you know, really banging it out, maybe we'd have two or there was another partner. Well, the year of the tablet exciting. for sure, when we had the right. Zoom tablet and yeah. the Galaxy um, Nexus. And then like the team was small enough and um, getting user testing was, was really critical enough that all of us would get those. Like all of the people on the platform team essentially would get one of these devices because that was the testing that we had. We didn't, you know, testing really wasn't the focus of the team at that time. And so like the testing that we did before we went to market with the release was critical. And so we had these devices, we used them as a regular devices, sometimes for much better than, much worse than better. Um, and therefore we knew all of the things about the devices as well as the things in the release that took advantage of the device features. And now, the platform team is so huge. Android is so huge. Google is so huge. Like that doesn't scale to this many people. And now they sort of focus on smaller groups of people who are going to be doing doing that user testing. And frankly, I don't have a lot of the um, access to a lot of the devices like when they're in. Well, it's not just that, but it's also smartphones are getting mature, right? I think yeah. you see new form factors like foldables, and that's very exciting. And you know, every new new phone, every new Pixel is exciting in its own right. But it's not like 15 years ago where every new phone was. A pretty big leap forward. Yeah. Right? It's like, oh, now we have OLED screens, or, or the battery is so much better, or it's so much faster. Um, I mean, it reminds me of laptops. So I remember a long time ago, like, you know, I was upgrading my laptop very regularly because kind of had to. Yeah. Nowadays, I mean, as long as it works. Yeah. Yeah. I think, like, in the last few releases, like, every release or two, there will be an interesting hardware feature or development that we will take advantage of. And you can sort of point at that. And then the rest of the stuff are sort of nuances or incrementals on top of that. So I'm thinking like, we got fingerprint stuff that really worked well. We got face detection that worked better than the earlier stuff. We got, you know, the the notch and like, where is exactly is that notch? And how are we figuring that out? Mm -hmm. The rounded corners, the rounded edges, like there are these little things that come up and then the platform needs to figure out how to deal with those. Um, the camera stuff, I think. In I mean, the camera gets devices, better yeah. constantly, and that's that's fantastic. And and that's an interesting thing. Like the episode that we had with the guy from Camera Research was really interesting because there's a blurry line between like what's the amazing new hardware that's coming out with the top of the line phones versus how much are we just doing in software because software can do amazing things with uh, compute, right? And then, Shh, don't I, tell people who like to buy cameras that you know. <laughs> I, I mean, it's more amazing if you also have the sensors and bigger, uh, but yeah. So I, I'm never, I'm never clear on like the new camera feature. Like, what is a like a limitation that's just on the pro devices with you know the extra lenses and sensors and stuff. I mean, sometimes it might be like, you know, uh, the hardware, but on the side of the camera where you need more memory or you need more CPU yeah. power or more GPU to run. I mean, I, I don't know, right? But it's not necessarily that it's, yeah, it's not the camera itself. It's what else? Well, we have been talking about having an episode on that. So stay tuned. On? On on what we're doing in the cameras with the raw format. I saw some questions, you know, online about like the raw format and all these things. So we should bring in someone from you know android camera someone from pixel someone from photos i feel like you know it'd be interesting to hear from someone who's a domain expert Ooh, we, can we, we can, can, can talk about ultra up. hdr yeah we could uh can i call in for that one yeah okay. yeah back to um the the the, the platform developments i think you know uh, something that happened this year which i think was really exciting was mainline modules i think you know maybe underreported i would say it's it's one of those things that you've you know if you're an android developer, you've heard for years that well you know when you finally release a new API, well, now you have to wait until everyone has that version of the phone. And with mainline modules, we're actually shipping, we're actually backporting APIs and features to older versions. So, and in particular, like art and the APIs are now a mainline module. I mean, even right? without the APIs, the fact that you get the runtime is such a critical piece yeah. 
for for our developers and our users. So just be, knowing that we can Bug backport well. yeah. the better garbage collector, you know, better VM. Uh, I mean, not VM, but uh, that's that's fantastic. Yeah, that's a huge benefit yeah. for and everyone. I think I think it was this year, right? That I mean, I think we shipped SDK extensions last year. But mm -hmm. I think this is the year. But I think we announced. Look, <laughs> we're actually more importantly, we had an episode on it this year. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. Can't remember when spring. I don't know. It's all a blur. Yeah. Yes, it is. The other point I was thinking about when when you were talking about the uh, the, the lack of unit testing, whatever, like that has been a massive investment for Android now yep. is more and more testing. And in fact, it's the same thing for Studio, right? So we've been doing more and more testing. And something exciting that happened for us this year is that we've been, we, we built this new end-to-end -end automation framework so we don't have to have manual tests for everything. So it's actually like running the real software on various OSs and actually asserting that things are working. And we automated sort of the, the key scenarios that we used to use to sign off on Canary builds. And so normally, you know, we would cut a branch for a Canary and then it'd be a week or two of testing and then we would release it. So like you fix a bug and then two, three weeks later, you know, you should see it. Now, I think we're down to something like 15 hours between branch cut and release because we are just running automated tests. I'm sure people are like, <laughs> what took you so long? Testing has been here forever, right? But for some for some reason, when you're shipping across multiple OSs and so on, like this has been hard for us. So uh, well, also automating, as I assume, something the scale of Android Studio, and that also, I mean, you have a foundation that that you don't. It's, it's own. complicated because yeah. like it's it's not a single process, and you have things like the emulator, which is a different. It's you can't mm. just do Java testing, right? So, so it's hard. But it just happened to me recently that I. Uh, I happened to fix a bug while sitting on the shuttle, you know, on like on a Tuesday night. And that happens to be close to the branch cutoff. And I got like, and, and we had this thing recently where we also, uh, when we release a version of Canary, we tag all the bugs that correspond to fixes in that Canary going like, okay, this has now been released. Get this version, right? So like, you know, it was late the next day that I saw an email going like, okay, this bug fix that I just did, it's now been released, which I thought was- Yeah, this kind of integration tests can also be flaky in very complex systems yeah. uh, and it's very difficult. I recently had to deal with a flaky test and <laughs> that wasn't fun. Well, you can, if you follow the, if you follow the commits in OSP, you can see I'm slowly losing my sanity trying to address that flaky test. <laughs> well, what's hard is that sometimes it's not the test that's flaky, it's the product that's flaky. And we've had that, right? So we had, yeah. we had a debugger test. So debugging is something we've invested a lot in and we continue to invest a lot in, right? But we had this thing where I think like 1% or 0.1% or of the time that the debugger wouldn't attach. And so the test was flaky. <laughs> but it turns out, no, no, like if we can run the test, you know, repeatedly over, you know, we, we can actually see and, and track down that this was actually a product bug, which we which we investigated. Yeah, and when I say flaky test, that, you know, I include yeah. that. Uh, in my case, for instance, it was, it involved creating surface views, which involves multiple windows, which involves the window manager. And so, you, you know, you're basically testing the entire operating system at that point. Yeah. Uh, and the test is flaky in the sense that the test tries to do its best to like wait for the right time to assert things. Yeah. But yeah, weights are dangerous, but but this is why those tests are so valuable because they're really yeah. running the whole thing. And sometimes unit tests, you know, I mean, there's all these like photos, right? Of passing unit tests, but failing integration tests, right? Like there's all these things that can go wrong, but you really need to actually ultimately make sure the software works. Yeah, I spent the last two weeks working on flaky tests as well. It seems like most of my stuff, for some reason, I, is I, flaky. Yeah, we should talk flaky. about that. Yeah, I, I'm sure it's not um, the person who wrote the code, but uh, basically, when you're dealing with animation or the stuff I was working on the last couple of weeks was um, jank stats, which is um, performance based stuff, but it's like it's very specific to this needs to happen on this frame right here, but it's an inherently multi process and multi threaded situation where like you're sending information down and then some other thread internally is sending information back and being able to consistently and concretely line those things up ends up being a really hard and sometimes just unsolvable problem. Yeah, and if you're, if you're, you can write the test to be not flaky, but then sometimes you don't test enough. Uh, yeah. I recently ran into that where I made some changes in the animation code and you know, the test pass, integration test, unit test, whatever. Then I think where run into trigger the bug and that bug happened with exactly one float value that was passed to the implementation. If that float value was the last possible float value before 1.0 as a float, the code <laughs> would crash. <laughs> I had considered at some point, you know, testing every possible float value, but it turns <laughs> out the test takes several minutes to run. So that was a little too much. <laughs> huh. 
Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, you know, this, this was like, yeah, everything's fine. Have you ever considered, because I wanted to do this and I don't, I can't remember I've done it, but like having a test where you also add some randomness. So yeah. over time you get coverage, but you trade it off with like, hey, this one might fail and, you know, in the middle of, yeah, you know, weekend. it's always tough because, I mean, there might be some very specific values that, you know, would take potentially like so long to be hit by yeah, the randomness. Yeah, I mean, covering all of yeah, the edge cases. And, yeah. and then uh, what I, what I find particularly problematic is the infrastructure that you have for tests and test results doesn't match what you need to debug what actually happened, right? So if it's something for- failed with a random value, act, like actually getting the information you need from logs or screenshots or screen recordings, like we don't necessarily have the stuff that will tell you, here's what happened. I mean, you, you can get that through in a cert, right? If it's just a value. But for the other stuff, like the a lot of the flakiness is like, well, you know what? The device wasn't fully booted when it ran the test or some other test popped up a dialogue that was on top of the screen and therefore like a, a screen capture didn't do the right thing. And you're like, yeah, but, but, I, but I can't tell. Like if I'm not sitting in front of the device, we don't necessarily have the bits that we need um, to actually follow. Well, then you can, you know, run the screen recorder at the same time, but then you influence the tests. Yeah, and side yeah. effect, all yeah. of the stuff that you're trying to test. Yeah, yeah our end-to-end test framework does that. It's- captures everything so you get a video file of the failure. Yeah, yep. it would be nice yeah. um yes some tests that actually reminds me one of the things that we i shouldn't use the word shipped because it's in preview but this year we have the firebase device lab integration in studio yeah. so you know for years we've had a firebase uh, test lab where you can run your espresso tests basically in the cloud but now we have this streaming thing so you can so you can access like if there's a particular device you're interested in that the lab offers you can basically like Mm-hmm. stream it and so you can like try it and see what's going wrong so if, if you for example work at a company and you don't have a foldable because they're pretty expensive but you want to make your you know let's say you have a social network app uh, and you want to make sure that it's like taking up the whole thing you can actually now go into the cloud and you can just try it and you can tweak your code until it passes so this episode of adb is sponsored by Tor Norby. <laughs> Yeah, so, this is all about getting like, you know, my needs served. You know, like I want this app to be fixed. You're really up leveling this. Like normally you have feature requests for the guests that we have, but as soon as we don't have guests here, you're actually submitting feature requests for external development organizations. Well, sorry. I think Welcome. it's feature requests like give him money. <laughs> well, it's because I'm a fan. I, I, yep. I like their products. I, right? I, and I do think they have run really quickly, like from coming out at a really good time when people were looking for alternatives yeah. from other social media oh, platforms. It's, it's, yeah. They've been adding stuff to it pretty quickly. So, yay, good job. Uh, and Torres just said, and it's Jetpack Compose. Yeah, and Jetpack yeah. Compose is amazing. Yeah, and I think that this year Compose had a bunch of performance improvements. That were uh, performance improvements, lots of new features. Obviously, we ship, I think, Compose 1.4, 1.5, 1.6 is in beta, so it's about to ship. Uh, yeah, lots, lots, of, uh, lots of goodness there. Uh, we, we had or we have a big focus on performance. I mean, we're still working on features, but, uh, and so we've been doing a, th- a lot of things internally in Compose uh, to improve performance. So if you switch, if you're 1.4, switch to 1.5, you should see improvements. If you're 1.5, try 1.6, it's getting better. And then 1.7 is gonna have even more. Um, and it's been fun. I mean, Chet, you've been, you've been so helping you've on some that. you decided that each new version is gonna be better than the previous. Yeah. What was that sort of thinking behind that? <laughs> Because I think users like it when when the new version of software is better than the old one instead of being worse. Yeah, it's a good experiment. Uh, <laughs> Looks better. Okay. No, it's it's also because some of it, you know, we it's always difficult when you build something as complex as Compose from the ground up, uh, and we've always kept performance in mind. But you know, you you're always trying to like make a compromise between you know the focus on performance versus features versus yeah, APIs. Because I'm sure everyone's like, well, my pet feature is this, you know, in recycling yeah. you. Blah, blah, blah. And, and, it's, and it's definitely tough to to figure out the prioritization. You know, we try to please as many people as possible. So uh, if you're still waiting on a feature, like, please bear with us. We know we, we want to help. Um, but, you know, as more and more apps have been adopting Compose, uh, we've been getting, it's interesting, right? Because you, you get Compose used in situations that we couldn't test ourselves, even within the Google apps that use Compose or that our own benchmarks uh, couldn't cover. Uh, just because of the sheer complexity of applications or just the myriad of ways that you can use a a large API surface like Compose. So as we've been getting those reports, you know, we've been investigating like more and more areas and we've discovered, you know, thankfully or maybe like unfortunately, I don't know, uh, optimization opportunities. Um, And so, yeah, we've been been delving into that and it's been super interesting. 
I think there's an interesting dynamic too with a new uh, API that comes online like Compose where we are basically replacing the old one. We're saying, okay, the new way forward for doing UI will be Jetpack Compose. Uh, and that means that applications that already have a complete application written the old way are going to say, okay, well, you know, maybe we should migrate this thing over. And so they take a stab at it and say, well, we migrated this thing, but this thing is actually demonstrably slower given, you know, the particular thing they're doing there. I'm not saying like overall it's slower, but maybe this particular thing was slower and then it's harder for them to migrate. So then it becomes a priority. Like the new features is great for people that, you know, want that new feature in their replacement for recycler view or for, you know, new applications that are writing with it. Maybe there's a powerful way they could do this or that if they had a new feature. But I think for the people that need to migrate, which is, I don't know, a hundred percent of the applications out there today. Well, it's really important for them. It's ninety nine, right? <laughs> it's really important. I'm, I rounded up um, floating point error uh, for it to work as well as the current one. Otherwise, the argument for rewriting working code is really difficult to make. And so in some of the work we've done, there's a you know, number of micro optimizations, but some are bigger. Like I think one that's, that we talked about in public was the modifiers. Yeah. Uh, they're very important in Compose. And it's been a year in the making, but we've been working on a new architecture for modifiers and we had to convert all the modifiers to the new way. So I think something like 295 modifiers. So, uh, and some of them are more trivial than others to port to the new to the new architecture. So it's taken time, but we've seen like dramatic improvements um, in, in various areas of Compose just thanks to that. Uh, and like I said, we're looking at, at every place in Compose to find optimizations. So we talked about some of those with, was it Leland and George? I believe so, yeah. Chuck, I think was on that episode, where we talked about some of the performance stuff that was ongoing and is still ongoing. Some of the results of, of like that effort at that time include some of the new APIs that you'll see in like androidx.collection. So we've come out with other data structures that are more optimal than- you know, For what we do. For what we do, um, you know, avoiding whatever the generics and, and standard collections. Uh, but there's stuff happening all over the board. One of the ones that I found really interesting was, um, so we have this uh, notion of semantics for accessibility uh, access, and there was a fair amount of overhead there. And it's really important, obviously, the functionality is critical. Um, the actual way that it works internally and maybe the performance aspects were not necessarily a, a P0 because there were other features that had to come online. And then there was a realization that some applications out in the world, some really common applications like, say, the password application that I use, trigger semantics, right? Because the way that they see information on screen to do things like autofill means that they have to know what's going on in the application or in the in UIs in general. And that means that we're automatically ending up in this um, code path that we didn't think was going to be dominant. Um, and then all of a sudden, actually coming up with a more optimal way to do these things becomes pretty important. I want to switch to something more controversial. Board everyone likes to huh? Okay. All right, go. Can we talk about optimization some more instead? <laughs> this is the year that we kind of went back into the office. Yay! Well, that's the thing. That I think that's the controversy. Because, Roman, do you yes. want to offer a contrary opinion? <laughs> no, I'm very glad that we're in the office. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's always what I've heard from you. Yeah, no, I mean, I, it is, it is, like, because I see a bunch of people on, on online, right, complaining about, like, you know, companies and, 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 like, how work from home is superior and all that. And I'm thinking, yeah, I, I have been a work from home person for years and years, and I like it part of the time. But I got to say, I think there, I think there is something about in office culture, too, yep. that is lost when you go full time remote. You know, I'm, you know, people have different experiences, right? But I, I do think this is an interesting, it's a discussion for our industry. I, I think it's fascinating. I have super strong opinions here, which come directly from the pandemic lockdown, which was me coming out of that whole situation, basically going stir crazy at home and realizing that as much as I like software and the work that I do and the code that I write, I find it fascinating to work on this, but I realized I am not at a particular organization because of the code that I write and the technology I work on. I am there because of the people that I work with. I think that we... We all, or most of us, build social networks, social groups that we 
live with. Basically, most of our waking lives are spent with these people, right? So you're yeah, saying that if you were to, in the future, leave Google, it would be because you no longer like the people who work with us. <laughs> I'm going to come back to that one. I think you made, um, made that pretty clear when it comes to you and I. So. <laughs> yes. I, I I think it's I think it's critical for us to maintain those relationships. Otherwise, like why are we anywhere? If 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 I'm going to work on my own, then why am I at, at this particular organization? Other than you know the the details of what that that job. Yeah, I mean I think you're you're someone who's quite social. I think I'm not quite right. as yep. much. But to me, just sort of being able to quickly resolve things, just kind of like yep. noticing, oh, someone's not busy. Now's a good time to go talk to them as opposed to be like, yep. oh, let me set up a meeting or write a whole email about it. Right. So there's a lot of that collaboration that I think is kind of useful. That, um, yeah, that's that's undeniable. I mean, it's a, it's a little bit fuzzy. It's, it's hard to quantify, which I think is part of the difficult part of the argument. But I think the flip side to mine, so I, I understand like I maybe have more need for people than some other people. Um, but the the flip side is um, I think that if work from home works for you, that's great for you. But I don't think that scales to the org. So I know some people have made the comment that they can be more productive at home. And I absolutely agree that that person can be more productive. But the people that that person works with are worse off at work because they're not there. And so I think there's an element of scaling your avail your availability to the other people on the team, be they new people that don't have the wherewithal to know what question to ask and need to absorb information through osmosis to people that need to, you know, establish a network of like the, the experts around I, um, to just the, the social connections I was talking about. I, I mean, I've seen a bunch of theories or that this is this, that the, the strategy behind requiring people back in the office is all about preserving real estate values. And I like I, to me, I, I think it's it's more what you're saying, right? Which is that companies can say, listen, there's some value to the org of having people yeah. collaborate because you transfer knowledge to more yep. junior people. Yep. Uh, and so I, I think that maybe is overlooked sometimes. I I but but on the other hand, so. commuting sucks, right? You know, it does. So, I mean, I do like the hybrid thing that we have gone to at least in this organization, where I'm in essentially three days a week. Right. And that like I am happy to take the commuting hit if I get to be around people, but I'm also happy to not commute every single day. Right? So that works for me. Um, but like the I think the easiest way to think about the, the social problem for me is think about the people on your team that joined during pandemic. Think about what complete lack of connection they have to the people that they worked with, or at least at that time. I think it's better now. I hope it is. Um, I, I would say they had a much harder time ramping up and missed a lot of what we got being around a team of people where the activity was buzzing and information was just yeah. flowing for the free Yeah, it is a it is a it's a it's a very hot topic in our industry. Yep. I don't know. Should we move on to politics or religion next? What do you think? <laughs> as long as you solve the problems as you go, you know. Yeah. Anything else from this um, year that we should cover? Well, I, I wanted to talk about the Shapes Library um, because I've been working on it. Um, also because I'm hoping it goes beta soon, so I hope people start using it. Um, one of the interesting things I think uh, if people want to play around with it is we just made a, ship, uh, a switch to uh, make it KMP friendly um, because we had the Compose team interested in using it and exposing it to some extent so that people can create these rounded shapes and do some morphs within the context of Compose. And it turns out if you're going to be used by Compose, which is a KMP library, Kotlin multi-platform, you need to be KMP friendly yourself, which means we cannot have Android dependencies in our library if Compose is going to depend on us. Um, so it created this sort of dependency nightmare where we couldn't use things like point F and uh, matrix and path and these things that are sort of fundamental to the way that we were doing things. And so point and matrix that. are not the most valuable <laughs> APIs out there. Right. Um, and and some of these, some of the changes that we had to make. So basically to make it KMP friendly, we had to remove those and find other ways of doing things. The point F removal was actually something we kind of wanted to do anyway, just because... Just tell me you used the pair class for point. <laughs> we we and did triple for vectors. That so explains we, so much about Studio. We thought about that. Not no no. We moved to a less elegant um, but more functional model of we just pass around either individual float values. Turns out there's not a lot of them in a point, um, or in some cases we pass an array in and out. It reminds me of old Android APIs, but there's a really good reason why but we. At least you don't have like a static point instance in the class that everyone's like messing with them. No. 
Oh no. <laughs> oh no. It looks like we don't, but okay. I, I, I mean, I won't say we don't do reuse of some objects because sometimes that's the right thing to do. So you don't have to allocate internal things. In this case, no, we're just, uh, we've got float arrays that we're using. So um, anyway, so look for that soon. I think that ships tomorrow, the KM pre friendly version of that, which means everyone's code is going to have to change. Um, but hopefully after that, we solidify this thing and ship beta soon. So I'm excited about that. It's been sitting there in alpha for far too long. Anything else go out from Android X this year that's exciting to talk about? I mean, so much. I should have printed the release yeah. notes for the year. Because, uh, you know, we... And if, you're, if you forget anything, <laughs> you know, well, I mean, it's going to be... Because we had a, a, be a number of changes, you know, uh, recycle view, view pager, navigation, uh, data store, all of our libraries, like, our, you know, a lot, or at least a lot of them are being actively developed and there's a number of, of interesting new features. There's been some gamification in other areas. Uh, you know, we're not supporting that completely uh, officially, I would say, but if you're interested in KMP, like there is some support in some of our libraries and that might help you uh, be unblocked, especially if you're porting existing code. Um, but yeah, there's been, a, there's been a lot going on. I tried to, to use, I, I have an app um, and I tried to um, port it to KMP, but I was I was using some libraries, I think Coil, right, for images or mm -hmm. whatever, and it, that one isn't KMP enabled. Okay. Apparently, they're working on it. I found the issue, so that's kind of exciting. I'm like, okay, I'm going to put a pin in that and come back to it when the my dependency is KMP. Yeah, and you know, it's uh, it's something that can be not hard, but it's work if you need to retrofit it, as as Chet has has observed. Uh, if you think about it from the beginning, it's of course a lot easier. Uh, and also depending on, on the nature of your library, like, you know, you're going to have an easier time. Like for instance, I have this small math library for Kotlin, uh, the campification involved only Gradle changes. Like I, all this library does is use, you know, floats and doubles in its own classes. So there was literally nothing to do. One of the exciting things, it's, it's a little early days, right? But we're, you know, we've been working with, uh, Gradle and JetBrains on a declarative model. So we kind of announced via blog posts a month ago or so that this is happening, right? So the the idea is take all the stuff that is currently, take a lot of the stuff that the ID cares about that is currently code and really should be data and make it data. So that was a very vague way of saying currently your build files look like data. They'll say my main SDK version is 21, for example, right? It turns out that's actually a code call and you could be calling get main SDK version, which makes a network call to a server. Like in theory, you could. So the fact that the build script is actually code makes it very hard for the ID to reason about it. So what we want to do is have this probably, mo I, I shouldn't say mode because that's the wrong word, but like you can declare your project in such a way that there really are data. Some things are going to be code still. You can still have tasks that are going to, you know, do publishing and so on, but like the locations of your source code, you know, the language level, all these things that really sh you probably think of as constants are going to actually be constants. And the value of this is so now the IDE can reason about it, you know, uh, and we can parse it in a more confident way. So if you, for example, currently have an error in your project definition, because you, you know, you had a merge conflict, two people both checked in and you need to resolve your local changes, you're kind of in trouble. Well, within, in a declarative world, we can probably do a much better job loading a partially broken project definition, for example. And the reason this thought triggered is when you're talking about the KMPification, this is the kind of thing that the tools can confidently do. Today, we cannot, right? We have some support in Studio via the project structure dialog to go things like add dependency or, you know, uh, fix a few similar simple things like add a module. If you've done crazy things in your build files, which, you know, like the Android X project does crazy things in the build files. And so Studio isn't very good at like editing the Android X project uh, itself. The idea here is we switch to a mode where the IDE can be fully confident about everything that's going on and we can perform these things for you and you don't have to you don't have to go in there and hand tweak these things because you probably don't want to. Yeah, that's that sounds exciting. I yeah. like it when the IDE does more for me. Yeah, yeah. And this was just like it, it you know, we were prototyping sort of doing it as a Android only solution, but it's much better for it to be done at the build system level and Gradle is really excited about it. They're working hard on it and putting people on it. And so I, I think this is gonna be Big thing next year. Um, Sounds good, but I, as soon as you said Gradle, my brain turned <laughs> off, so I missed everything. 
another thing that comes to mind, uh, lots of good work has been going on in the baseline profiles. Uh, now there's better integration in the ID and there was the new, uh, I think we call it DEX relayout, where we, based on, on, on the data, we reorganize the content of your DEX so that we can speed up startup times. Uh, and so it's added optimizations on top of everything else you are gaining from baseline profiles. Um, yeah, so really quickly, uh, if you use Android Studio, once we ship Iguana, which should be very soon, there's a new template. Uh, so you just basically say new baseline profile module. So it adds a new module to your project, which is all the plumbing for you. And so that one is the one that will, you know, your your main app depends on it and you get a new run config where you can yeah, say, yeah. To, to make it easier to build exactly. your own baseline profile. So it used you. to have to go to like this page and read all the stuff to do. Now it's just like, yeah, add this module to my project. So hopefully that'll help. Uh, with adoption because baseline profiles. Yeah, and I highly recommend developers to take a look at it. Uh, so if you're not using baseline profiles already in Iguana, please please take a look because the benefits that you can get uh, in terms of performance, but also startup time uh, optimization are, are huge. And it's not every day that we can give you, you know, 10, 20, 30, 50% improvements in areas like startup time. Uh, so, and it's, you know, not quite free because you need to create that module and so on, but it's not a lot of work considering the benefits you get out of it. Yeah. Should we move on to listener mail? What do you think? Sure. Uh, yeah, we had a few questions. We need a sound effect for a listener mail. <laughs> That's like a total radio thing that we should have. And I got, I'm looking at the buttons here and it says cough and talk back. And I don't think that's what we want. I mean, you can use the cough. That's yeah. not a, that's not a cough sound. Uh, work. Do you have or remember the questions? <laughs> I kind of remember, remember the questions. We had two. we had two questions on Metalava. Oh yeah. And the question I remember clearly was someone was asking why don't we use and really we probably should read the email so we get credit to the person who actually sent it in. But uh, we're just going to make up some names now. Uh, so one of them was uh, why don't we use the Kotlin binary compatibility that's plugin? Right. Uh, I would have to go ask the infrastructure team, but I wouldn't be surprised if the reasons because we have been using our own API tracking on Android and Android X since. Yeah, that, that is the correct answer. Android one, yeah, and everything that's and and part of our rules for API tracking include binary and source compatibility, and we have internal pages on that, and so we're yeah, so, covered. So I think that you know Android had API tracking since the beginning. It had to. It knew that we can't mm -hmm. break compatibility because apps will break, right? So this is even older than Kotlin, right? Even when Kotlin was internal development. So and we so, need to do it for Java, right? So yeah, and it was and originally it, it was only for and the reason we had MetaLove is MetaLove ported the, or didn't port it. It reimplemented so that we can support both Java and Kotlin. So the the thing is that Android had this whole signature file format already, and so MetaLava implements that and a bunch of other stuff. It goes and gives advice on APIs, like, hey, we don't want you to do this with the API. Lambda should be last, this kind of thing. So that is the answer to that. And I think the second one was something about um, the the a Gradle plugin for MetaLava. So apparently someone has written one. I wasn't aware of that. Okay. Um, yeah. We're doing a really terrible job. Why don't you talk amongst yourselves? I will. I will turn my pixel fold back on and find these questions. <laughs> well, there was a third question that was for you, Chet. Oh, where is Chet? What happened to Chet? <laughs> what happened to Chet? <laughs> so yeah, I was out for the fall since the last the last podcast episode I did was in August with uh, the Web GPU team, mm -hmm. um, and then I went on leave. So the short answer is I was on leave for three months uh, doing something completely different. Um, the longer answer is I'm still doing that thing. Um, so I. Um, for various reasons, uh, started taking my hobby job. So I've been doing writing and comedy stuff for many years, just on the side, and I thought I would like to do that a little bit more. So I am taking classes out in Chicago uh, to do that, basically comedy screenwriting classes. Um, so I'm about to go back out there, uh, but I will still be working. Uh, the trick is to figure out how I can call in remotely. So we have had some remote guests, and I called in once as a remote host, it is not as easy. Um, we really like being back in the studio. We all think that it makes for a much better podcast. On the other hand, I can't fly back from Chicago just to be on a Tuesday afternoon recording. Um, so that doesn't work very well. So if we can figure out how to have me call in from my little studio apartment in Chicago, um, it would be great to uh, participate in. You know how to podcasts. use Google Meet, right? Uh, that is not the hard part. Uh, the hard part is, so here, here's, here's the difficult for the people watching this thing on YouTube. So we're all looking at each other and I can tell when you're about to say something so that I know to keep talking to block you out from the conversation. But 
if the person calling in is on a TV monitor over 90 degrees from the direction we're looking, it's really difficult to know when they want to jump in. And then you, as, as a person that did this once, you basically keep waiting for there to be an entrance and there is none. Um, so it is not as smooth. So if we can figure out how to make that better than it has been, uh, it'd be great to call in for future episodes. We could have a Pixel tablet or a Pixel fold in front of us. Yeah. Uh, so we're working on that. Um, I hope to be in the January episodes. Um, we'll see. Unless... And I guess look for Chet Haas in the credits <laughs> when you're looking for new productions related to comedy, right? You're going to be writing yeah. some stuff. I, yeah, we'll we'll see where this thing is leading. But at the very least, it's a it's a fun adventure to go and move and do a thing that is not what you've been doing for many decades. Yeah, and that question was from uh, at the Nathan Mead, who asked, "Where's Chet?" Uh, <laughs> we got the question right uh, on the Kotlin binder compatibility validator plugin. That was a question from Nikola Despotovsky. You got the question right, but did you get the answer I wrong? think so. Yeah. Basically, we didn't use it because it predates and we had all these other use cases. So and we need to support Java because yeah. Android X is more than... Yeah. And I think we cooking. actually care a little bit about source compatibility too. Like we're actually analyzing at the source <laughs> yeah. level. We're, yeah, we not we're not analyzing at the just at the binary level. Uh, and we extract source artifacts as well, you know, from the source code. Um, uh, and the last question is from EFE Money. Uh, can MetaLava team also provide the Gradle interface to configuring MetaLava? Hat tip to Tyler for his amazing Gradle MetaLava plugin, but it's failing be falling behind AOSP MetaLava development. So I guess, you know, you uh, can maybe ask Arima, since he's in your org, uh, to provide a Gradle well, plugin. Please file a feature request. And the, the, the best promise I can make is that we'll take it into, in, into consideration uh, in our prioritization. For what about our our slogan on Android? Uh, Android is an open source platform, and we welcome contributions <laughs> from the larger. Community. That's kind of not a nice thing to say. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, I, yeah, I think it's so a easy. very you know like no, I, it, I, yeah, I, it's a it's a good request, uh, but you know, uh, and like I said, we need to take that into account with everything else we have to do. There are some things that we can and talk about, and some others that we can because you know. Beyond what we do for for our, our external community, there's a lot of work that we do for internal needs at Google uh, that you know is not visible. Yeah. Uh, but there's also a lot of uh, nice upcoming things in MetaLava. I know yeah. that they were working on implementing type mm -hmm. use annotations, uh, and so it would be bad if this plugin is falling behind because you really want that. Um, so uh, so th those are the questions for this time. If you have questions on the current episode, Chet uh, has a question. Yeah, I was going to say, like, this is a new thing since I was here for a podcast. I didn't realize we took questions. Um, so for the people that aren't seeing this on YouTube, you might be wondering, where, where are these questions? So are you really admitting that you have not been watching while you were in Chicago? I, I and focused I'm holding on... my hands. Well, next it it, 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 it was not in the podcast, so why would you watch it? <laughs> Uh, yes. So yeah, I guess the YouTube channel is the place for those. Um, That's right. There are obviously an infinite number of questions that could be asked, but like questions that are specific to the topic that we covered in the podcast, certainly um, welcome to okay. ask them there. Yeah, ask anything uh, and, you know, any kind of feedback. We on... do not promise that we will answer all the questions. No, uh, it's going to be tricky. I, I can imagine that, for example, a little discussion on like remote policies are going to generate yeah. some opinions. and. You know, uh, we can't probably read all of those out on the air. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, definitely, definitely appreciate feedback. Uh, great. Um, nice to be on the podcast again. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, for thanks. watching and listening. Uh, and I guess that's it. It's a wrap. Thanks. Thanks.